So, ladies and gentlemen, okay, we are we are going to jump around a lot this year with our new textbook because just the way that they have the topics organized in our book is is a little different than I the order that I like to teach in. So, we're jumping to chapter 10, which is on gases, gas laws. I want you guys to know that this chapter will be combined with another chapter. It's going to be chapter 15, which is on equilibrium. They go together very well. Okay. And the good news about this chapter, it's pretty short and most of the material is going to be review from Chem 1, okay? if not all of it. All right, so we're talking about gases. Just a couple of general characteristics. Okay, a gas will fill any container it's put into. You could say the same thing about a liquid. It fills whatever container it's in. Gases will mix completely with any other gas. It's not like you have to stir it up or anything. And this is a concept we're going to talk about a lot in this chapter, pressure. And I'm going to give you a way to sort of visually understand the concept of pressure. Okay. If you could see all of the gas particles in this room, you would see them traveling at very high speeds, high energy, they're bouncing into each other, they're bouncing off the walls, the ceiling, the floor, okay? It would look like chaos. Every time one of these gas particles strikes any surface, okay, it is exerting a force over some kind of an area, all right? That is the definition of pressure, force per unit area. Okay, and if we think about this in like more of a physics way, right, most of you are in physics or have taken physics, okay, a Newton is a unit of force. We are not going to talk about Newtons in here, that's a physics thing. Okay, in chemistry the metric unit for pressure is a Pascal the units that we are more often going to deal with, atmospheres, sometimes we'll work with kilopascals, but more often these are the three, these are our heavy hitters, okay, in terms of units of pressure. Atmospheres, tor, millimeters of mercury, okay, these are the same thing. And you might, you probably will have to do some converting from one unit of pressure to another. And the nice thing about your equation sheet, if you guys would, look on the back side of this equation sheet. On the right hand side, right here. You will see that this conversion is given to you. Now, in all honesty, we're going to use it so much that you will have it memorized and you won't need that to be on your equation sheet, but it is there, just so you know. Okay. All right. Now, one of those units was millimeters of mercury. <clears throat> Okay, and some of you might be thinking, you know, millimeters, that's, that's a unit of length. You know, what does that have to do with pressure? Well, it comes from using a barometer, okay? And this picture, this is like a super, super simplified drawing of how a barometer works, all right? Let me explain what's going on here. All right, this is an open container of mercury, all right? That's not something you typically want to have around, okay? Mercury is poisonous, it causes brain damage. It's not a good thing, okay? But the point is, some part of the barometer is exposed to the environment, 
Okay, I keep a barometer up on my front table. You can clearly see this does not have an open bowl of mercury in it. Okay, so you have this inverted tube that's closed at the end, and you have within that tube, there is some mercury in there. These blue arrows represent the pressure exerted in the atmosphere or in the room that you're in. When the height of this column is 760 millimeters high, that is considered standard pressure. Okay. One atmosphere, 760 torr, 760 millimeters of mercury, that's standard pressure. Okay. Now, you guys don't, don't know this about me, but um, I'm a weather junkie, okay? Like if this whole teaching thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go into meteorology, okay? I think things, the, the behind the scenes of weather is fascinating, okay? And barometers are used a lot to predict the weather. For example, if you've ever watched you know, the Weather Channel, not just your local news, but, you know, the Weather Channel, which is going to give you a little bit more information. Sometimes you will see a barometer reading. It'll say something like, the barometer reading is 760 millimeters and falling. That's what they'll usually say. Here's the situation, okay? If you've ever seen a weather map, and sometimes there'll be like a big letter L over our Northern Virginia area. That means a low pressure system is coming into our area. Think about it. If these blue arrows are not pressing down on the surface as much, like it's kind of easing up a little bit, what's gonna <coughs> happen to this column of mercury? Is it gonna go up or fall? Down. It's gonna fall, yeah, it's gonna go down. Right? And low pressure systems tend to carry higher humidity, clouds, rain. Okay, so if they see the barometer falling, the weather people will say, okay, there's probably rain in our forecast. If any of you are following the news right now, we have a hurricane, okay, down in the Caribbean right now, Hurricane Matthew. The center, the eye of a hurricane has incredibly low pressures, like really low, okay? Whereas, if you see a weather map and you see a big H over our Northern Virginia area, that means a high pressure system is coming, which usually means low humidity sunshine, right? And you would see the column rising, okay? Because high pressure is pushing down, so that's gonna cause the column to rise, okay? So meteorologists use barometers to predict the weather, okay? But ultimately, it's used to measure atmospheric pressure. So you can use a barometer. You can also use something called a manometer, not a manometer, okay? A manometer, similar setup, an open tube here, Okay, atmospheric pressure is pushing down. I want you to look at these two pictures side by side. Which one would be showing, weather-wise, a high pressure system coming into our area? Left or right? The one on the left, high pressure, which means pushing down more. Okay. <coughs> All right, let's get to our three main gas laws. Okay, Boyle's law is our first one. Relationship between pressure and volume. It is an inverse relationship. Inverse meaning if one goes up, one increases, the other will decrease. All right, and let me come back to this image of how do you visualize pressure, okay? I want you guys in your mind, if ever you're asked a question about pressure, is the pressure increasing, is it decreasing? I want you to think 
is whatever we're doing causing there to be more hits on the side of the container? Okay, if so, that means the pressure must be going up. If whatever we're doing is causing fewer hits, then that must mean the pressure is decreasing. All right, so if you look at this picture here, we have a sample of gas in this syringe. This is a pressure gauge. All we have done is decreased the volume, okay? And look what happens to the pressure. And think about that, guys. That should make sense. If I decrease the volume, the amount of gas is the same. Don't you think these gas particles, because there's less room to move around, don't you think they're going to be hitting the side of the container more? They are, okay? I mean, imagine yourselves, you know, in this room, you are gas particles. Let's just pretend here. I move all the furniture out of the room, you put blindfolds on, and I just tell you to run around, okay? That's what a gas is like. It's crazy. Everybody's bumping into each other. Imagine if I took that little exercise and I said, you know what, this is kind of boring doing it in this room. Let's move it into the chemical storeroom next door, which is teeny tiny. And I still made you do that. Run around with blindfolds on. You're going to not only bump into each other a lot more often, you're going to run into the walls a lot more often. Same situation here. Okay. Last thing I want to say about this, this relationship only holds true mathematically if temperature is held constant. If temperature is changing, this relationship doesn't apply anymore. Okay, that's what it looks like graphically. Let's move on. Second gas law, Charles law. The relationship between temperature and volume. It's a direct relationship. If one of these factors is increasing, so is the other one. Okay. And again, this should make sense to you. Can you guys tell me, please, if you increase the temperature of a sample of gas, what physically is going to happen to those particles? What are they going to do? Move faster, yeah. Move faster with more energy, okay? Whereas if you decrease the temperature, okay, they're not going to move around as much. In this situation, you have the gas particles literally punching out the sides of the balloon, whereas here, they're not. Okay. If you've ever bought a balloon in, let's say, winter, okay. if you've ever bought a balloon in the nice, warm store, and then you go out into the parking lot where it's bitter, bitter cold, you'll notice that your balloon will shrink a little bit, okay? Whereas the opposite is true. If you buy a balloon in the summertime, if you buy it in the nice air-conditioned store, you take it outside, it will expand, okay? All right, the last thing I wanna say about this is that any of your gas laws where temperature is involved, ladies and gentlemen, this is super important. Your temperatures must be in units of Kelvin. Let me explain why. Tell me, please, because I hope you know this. You should. What is the freezing point of water? What temperature? Okay, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. How about in Celsius? Zero. Okay. What happens if you put zero in the denominator? does not exist, okay? So what is zero degrees Celsius in Kelvin? 273, and that is a perfectly reasonable number to put in there. And I know what you're thinking. Well, can't you have zero Kelvin? What is that called? Absolute zero, which has not yet been attained, okay? It is a theoretical temperature. Now, scientists have gotten really close, but still not to zero. 
Okay, so temperatures have got to be in Kelvin. All right, there's your last one. Temperature and pressure this time. Again, it's another direct relationship. The variable that you don't see here, volume, that must be constant in order for this mathematical relationship to be true. Again, keep your temperatures in Kelvin. All right. So those are your three gas laws. Put them all together and you get the combined gas law. This would be a situation where none of these variables are being held constant. They are all changing. Okay. The nice thing about the combined gas law, it's got all three gas laws in it. For example, let's say you're given, I don't know, maybe a multiple choice question where there's two pressures given, one volume, you're supposed to solve for the other volume, and the question either doesn't mention temperature at all, or they tell you it's held constant, cover up the variable that they don't mention. There's Boyle's law right there. Okay, All three of your gas laws are in there. Okay, And let me show you one other trick. All right, and I did not I did not make this up. I stole this from someone else. Okay. If you take these three bar variables and write them on a piece of paper in alphabetical order, they've got to be in alphabetical order. Let's take that situation I was just saying. You're given two pressures, one volume. You're supposed to solve for the other volume. If I put my pen over the variable that is either not mentioned or they tell me it's held constant. Are you ready for this? You might want to hold on to something because this is earth shattering. Are you ready? Yep, hold on. As pressure increases, volume decreases. Oh. What just happened? <laughs> what is this voodoo magic? Okay, let's say you're given you know, two temperatures, one volume, you're supposed to solve the other volume. Here's Charles' law right here. Temperature goes up, so does volume. Okay? I know. I know. It's exciting. Now, can you guys see that if you put these letters in the wrong order, that's going to mess you up completely. All right? Alphabetical order. Okay?